Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi, everyone. Before we get started, I wanted to thank all of my supporters on Patreon. Their financial support helps cover the costs associated with hosting and producing the Backyard Ecology podcast and blog. If you would like to join them, you can find out more information on the Backyard Ecology website or by searching for Backyard Ecology on the Patreon website. Today we're talking with Anthony Tromboli. You may remember Anthony from the trail camera episode that he did with us several months ago. Anthony is a wildlife biologist and my husband. He also helps me with my nursery and habitat consulting business. Hi, Anthony. Welcome back to the podcast. Hello. It's great to be here. So winter is often thought of as a time to really slow down and do more inside activities than outside activities. But when it comes to gardening with native plants or doing habitat management for pollinators and wildlife, there's actually quite a bit that we can be doing outside during the winter. Plus, we have the added benefit then of it not being as hot, there aren't any chiggers, and there's a whole lot fewer ticks and mosquitoes. Used to be able to say that there weren't any, but not so much anymore, but there are a lot fewer. Yeah, um, unfortunately, it's not been cold enough the past few years to really knock them down. And I hear from people every day that are getting a tick or two. So they are still out there, but no mosquitoes for for the most part. And For the uh, most part. We've been out a couple of times this winter already, and there was a mosquito or two flying around, but not bad. A few. Definitely no chiggers. It, the cold does put them to bed, so that is a good thing. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And one of the things that I know we both like to do on our property during the winter is to just go out and look around. And because we both have different interests and experiences, even though we're both wildlife biologists, we often notice and focus on different things. So can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that you're looking for related to habitat management at this time of year? Uh, This time of year is a great time to get out and uh, take a look at your plants that you have. Um, I know there's no leaves on the trees, but if you've learned your trees uh, to some degree, you can tell them by the bark. And this time of year is great because you can just look through the woods and and you can see what's out there pretty easily, you know, especially if it's an open woods and you can definitely see invasive species because uh, a lot of them don't lose their leaves. Most of your vines, English ivy, uh, winter creeper, Japanese honeysuckle all keep their leaves. They show up really well this time of year. Uh, Bush honeysuckle will always have a few leaves on it. Privet will have leaves on it and fruit. Um, Any of the euonymuses, the burning bushes, they'll have fruit and they show up really well this time of year. Yes. One thing about invasive species, it's a lot easier to notice them now. And I used to say that it's the only thing green because they're the major thing green out there right now a lot of times. But there's also some really interesting native species that some people might have if they have the right habitat. So you can't just go by anything green. So I really like looking for crane fly orchids, which are really cool native orchids that we've got. But they put up the leaves in the fall and you'll have the leaves in the fall and the winter and early spring. And then by the time they bloom in the summer, the leaves are gone. And there's several other species of native orchids that do the same thing. But then you're looking at onesies and twosies and small patches and only in the right habitat. Whereas with basic species, there's oodles and oodles and oodles of them usually. Yeah. Um, you can see a few other native species right now. We're right on the edge of where uh, American holly starts to be fairly common in the mountains. And uh, there's a few growing in our woods. And when you look through, you can, you can see them very easily. They're, they've got bright green, shiny leaves and light colored bark. They just stand out. And, uh, you know, your standard cedars where every place in the Southeast has cedars. You're going to, you're going to see that being green out there, but uh, you know, there's, there's a few things, other hollies, if you're lucky enough to have them on your property. Yeah. You were talking about euonymus, burning bush and stuff like that. There is a native euonymus that we've got. So you've got to kind of be a little careful depending on where you're at. 
But for the most part, if it's green right now, give it a second look. And again, the species that we're talking about that we're seeing here in Kentucky, some of them are going to be the same in other states. Some of them are going to be different. And the further north you go, you're going to have different species. And the further south you go, you're going to have different species. That's just the way it is. And then it's mountains versus not mountains. And there's always a little bit of having to know, having to know your own area and how to apply any of these broad things that you find on the internet or in talks or wherever to your own property. Well, that kind of brings up another another thing is uh, it's a good time to look and see what the critters are browsing this time of year because they don't have greenery to eat. So uh, the deer will be browsing woody browse species and uh, strawberry bush, the native euonymus, happens to be what we call an ice cream plant to deer. They love it. So if you find a euonymus that is totally nipped to pieces, it's probably native strawberry bush. Uh, it's hard to get established a lot of places because the deer just wipe it out as soon as you put it in the ground. Um, they, they love it. Yes. And talking about animals, I mean, one of the things I like to do, because I really love the songbirds and stuff, that's one of the groups I'm interested in a lot, is to just go out and see where they're at and what they're feeding upon as far as the plants and which seeds they're at and looking at the natural brush piles that they're in and things like that and looking at, see how they're set up, um, better ways to recreate that in other areas so that I've got even more habitat, just all kinds of little things like that. Yeah, we have a lot of old fields on the farm. Uh, they're not prairies by any stretch. They're just overgrown fields. Uh, lots of goldenrod in them. And when it gets cold out, it's a good time to go uh, just watch those goldenrod patches, especially if they have goldenrod galls, because the birds will start pecking the, uh, the little larva out of those galls. And it takes them a while to get them out. It's not quick. So if you got a good pair of binoculars, you can sit there. You might see a dozen, two dozen species of birds working through a patch of goldenrod. Oh, yeah. I love the big patches of goldenrod. We've got a volunteer patch that popped up in our yard and kind of let it go this year just because I wanted to see it's right outside my window. So we decided to let it go. And I've had so much fun just watching the birds work through there all the winter long so far. And don't have any goldenrod galls in this patch, but some of the other patches on the farm, we definitely have them and enjoy watching them there. Yeah, it's kind of hit or miss. You'll have a patch that has none and you'll have another spot where almost every stem has a gall in it. Um, and I'm not sure why they pick them like that, but. Uh, Part of it has to do with the species. The goldenrod gall fly only lays their eggs and the larvae only go in to certain species. So Part of it can be the species that we've got. Um, I know you and I, unless we've got a real good reason to, we don't necessarily identify the field goldenrods down to species just because they can be really, really complicated and hard to distinguish sometimes. A lot of times it comes to taking them inside and looking at them under a microscope or under a really good hand lens. Most of the time, there's no reason for that for what you and I do. Yeah, goldenrods are even worse than grasses as far as figuring out what they are. I mean, there's whole books of dichotomous keys just for goldenrod, if that tells people anything. There's that many species of them. They all kind of look alike. There's a few that are really easy, but most of them kind of all look alike. <laughs> yeah, for the basics, yes. Here in Kentucky, we've got over 30 different species that we could potentially have. Now, some of those are very rare. We've got an endangered species here in Kentucky. Some of those are very, very common. Some of them tend to be more in the woods and open areas in the woods. Some of them are, like I said, the field goldenrods that turn everything yellow in the late summer and early fall. And those are the ones that can be really difficult to identify. Yeah, especially now when they have no flowers and they're just dead stems. Um, yes, exactly. They're not like trees. Trees and bushes, this is a great time to go out and identify them because uh, they don't have leaves, but you don't need leaves and uh, you can get close to them. You're not getting bit by bugs. It's probably my favorite time to go out and survey property and, and habitat actually is right now, middle of winter. Now it's got its benefits, but I tend to like the flowers and the herbaceous plants more. So I'm a little more limited now as far as looking at those sorts of things. But like I said, there are some interesting ones out there and you can see so much more. It's not just about the plants either. I mean, one of the things I like to do, and I know you like to do it as well, is just look for those different animal signs, whether it's the goldenrod galls and whether or not they've been pecked out 
or looking for tracks in mud in our case most of the time sometimes we get snow we get to look for them there but um further north people get to do actually snow tracking of them um one thing about when it gets uh to the point where the plants are dying back especially if it's a little wet and really if you've got snow for sure is you can find animal trails um, they're, they stick out really well when the plants are dead because where the, the animals have been running, they just basically beat them down into the ground. Um, you can see where the smaller critters, you know, raccoon, rabbit-sized animals are crawling through the, the underbrush. Um, deer trails really stand out this time of year. Toilets where animals use the bathroom repeatedly stand out really well this time of year. It's just a good time to get out. And on tracks, especially mud, we have mud here for at least six months out of the year. And then the rest of the time it's concrete and you don't see any tracks. But uh, right now there's tracks everywhere on our farm. Uh, it's, it's sloppy, muddy, it's been raining. Good time to be out there if you like being in the mud, which I do, so. Yeah, but you're weird. Um, no. <laughs> yeah, and talking about the rain, I mean, the late fall, winter, early spring, that's one of our rainy seasons, especially here in Kentucky. And so, one of the things I love doing is just looking for vernal pools because vernal pools are those wet areas or those mud puddles that show up every winter in the same place and they don't dry out until sometime in the spring or summer and they can be so full of life. So I love looking for them now, which is early winter. And then as we get more into late January, February, March, when it starts to warm up here in Kentucky, any warm day we get, I love to go out and look at those vernal pools and try and figure out what's in them. Because, I mean, you can have fairy shrimp and you can have early salamanders. We have some salamanders that will breed really early. Same thing with some of our frogs. And looking for either the adults or just the egg masses can be so much fun. Yeah, this, this time of year, they'll, they'll be filling up for sure here in the southeast because we've got rain. If you're farther north, you know, they'll hold water after snow melt. But down here, uh, the larger terrestrial salamanders are probably already in some of those ponds, some mm -hmm. of the species. The newts definitely are. Uh, newts will actually breed with ice on top of a pond. They'll be, you can see them under the ice uh, laying eggs. So we think of amphibians and reptiles as, you know, it has to be really warm for them. And for reptiles, that's mainly the case. But amphibians are very active when it's cooler out. Um, the wood frogs will be breeding here pretty soon. Um, not too far off, a couple months. But there's salamanders breeding for sure. There's frogs calling right now. You know, I can hear a spring peeper occasionally. It's been raining. They don't really ever go into full hibernation mode down here. They, they just get underwater and they come out as soon as it warms up. Yeah, wood frogs are one of my favorites of the early breeders. We don't have any on our property, but I know where to go find them. And so on these warm days, I will be out looking for them a lot of times. And I mean, here in Kentucky, I've heard the wood frogs starting their breeding courses and doing some early breeding at the end of January. So it's not like you have to wait super late. And they, they breed very early up north too. I'm from Indiana and I remember seeing tens of thousands of baby wood froglets, um, you know, leaving vernal pools in May, you know, and they were fully formed froglets by that point. They were going out into the woods. So um, they, they breed early, you know, a little ice and snow does not bother them. Right. Yeah. Wood frogs are fun for any of our listeners. If you haven't done this yet, go to Google and type in wood frog unfreezing. Because wood frogs can freeze solid and then unfreeze. They form basically a natural antifreeze in their bloodstream. And they'll literally freeze solid and then unfreeze and be perfectly okay. And it's so cool to watch. Yeah, they're found way, way up in through Canada. So another thing is, I mean, we have the smaller vernal pools, but in our part of the state here, we have transient lakes that fill up during this wet season. And I mean, they're, they're literal lakes. They're, they're acres and acres and acres of water. They look like any other lake that you'd go fish in, except most of them are a couple feet deep at the most. Most of them are shallower than that. And uh, this time of year, waterfowl all over them. Uh, they draw a lot of migrant uh, waterfowl, sand, sandhill cranes, 
uh, shorebirds. Um, they last into eh, early summer and then they're dried up and they're gone. You never know they were there. A lot of the places plant crops right over the top of them <laughs> and then they harvest them. And then the next winter they're flooded again. And uh, you get some weird birds there. I think they had a roseate spoonbill on one this year. And, you know, you, you never know what you're going to find at a transient lake. Uh, they're pretty cool places. Yes, they definitely are. And I mean, we're talking about water running and stuff like that. I mean, there's also always the need to check your properties and see if there's any erosion issues that are going on. I mean, this is a good time to see it. You can see where the water's running and how it's running and start to look at, okay, what do we need to do about this, if anything? Yeah, I mean, it, it poured last night and this morning, and uh, I can look out the window. There's, there is water gushing through the ditch that comes under the road into our creek, and it is nothing but mud. So that is the pasture across the street flowing into our creek and will eventually end up in Barren River Lake. I can help it on this end, but sometimes you can't fix the whole erosion issue. But, uh, you know, if you get out there and you see some uh, serious gouging of banks or um, a channel being cut through a field, you know, that's something you probably can mitigate to some extent and help lessen that soil loss. Just remember, you know, it's not going to get better. <laughs> it will always get worse if it's an erosion issue. If you don't do anything about it. Yeah. And you're not going to stop the water from flowing there either. It is going to flow there. It wants to flow there. A lot of times, if you look on an old map, you'll find that there used to be a stream there or at least a transient stream there that's been filled or tiled or something in the past. And, and the tiles have now failed because they're old and they're plugged up and the water is now coming back to the surface. So oftentimes you can figure out why the water is flowing there. And uh, usually it's because there used to be a stream there. Yes. And doing things like planting vegetation, that's going to have deeper root systems and help to slow the water is going to be really helpful with that. Yeah. And when you're doing that, it's best if you can disturb the soil as little as possible when trying to get the plants in the ground. So uh, things that you can plant from cuttings directly like willows or many of the smaller dogwood species like gray dogwood, silky dogwood, We'll, we'll take from a cutting just fine if the ground is, you know, got some moisture in it. The other thing is, you know, if you have to disturb the soil, try to do it at the time of year when you're not expecting massive rains and floods, because otherwise your plants are just going to wash out. But, uh, you know, nine bark, button bush, many of those dogwood species, willows, they all grow quick. They all have big fibrous root systems because they grow in wetlands. So they have to get anchored and, uh, they do a real good job of securing the soil. Nine bark's probably got the most explosive root system of any plant out there. And it, it will not look like a huge bush, but it will have a root system that's probably four or five times bigger than the above ground part of the plant. And um, we grow them. And I, I can tell you that the roots go everywhere. They are super aggressive at, at trying to find a place to grow. It's a kind of impressive, actually. You'll have a plant in a one gallon pot. It'll have, you know six ounces of top growth and two pounds of roots on it. So uh, they're a neat plant. Good for pollinators too. Oh yeah, exactly. It's great when you can find plants that do double duties. And when you have your native plants, I mean, they're part of the ecosystem. So yes, there are things that eat them. There are pollinators for them. There are just a whole mass of different things that they're used for naturally by the animals whether that's insects or reptiles or amphibians or mammals or birds or whatever, that these native plants have evolved and adapted to be part of that whole system. And if somebody's listening and they've got these erosion issues that they might need help with, talk to your local natural resources conservation service, the NRCS. They a lot of times will have people that can help you figure out the best ways to handle it. And sometimes there's funding that you might be able to get to help with that as well. Yeah. Major issues are not cheap to fix. I'm just going to say that it's going to require heavy equipment work a lot of times, especially if you have a undercut or high bank stream or something like that. Uh, and it's going to take some engineering. It's not something you can just go out there with your tractor and say, Hey, we're going to fix this because the, the army Corps of engineers is not going to be happy with you. Um, one, you didn't get a permit Two, it didn't have engineering approval. So, uh, you don't want to do that. Do not make the army Corps of engineers angry. 
it's it's not good but yeah it's it's tricky when you got a major issue i mean if it's just a, a ditch that a lot of water flows through and you know it gets muddy when when there's flow but there's not a huge amount of erosion it's not undercutting the bank big chunks of the ground aren't flowing away you can usually fix that with a vegetative approach um, but they can cost share you a lot of times on uh, a vegetation planning along there you're going to have to plant what what's on their list you know you're not going to get to to pick and choose because you like something because it's pretty it's going to have to be on the nrcs list it's a government program it has very stringent rules you have to follow but a lot of states will also have a farm bill biologist or some equivalent of that that will help you out they actually write the contract up for you make sure you understand it and they'll help you if you have any questions with the implementation so uh, it's not as bad as you would think and if you do it right it looks pretty good you know it'll it'll be a nice big bushy area if you plant a bunch of dogwoods the deer will thank you because they will absolutely love chewing on that they don't eat nine bark though so you know if you got a lot of deer nine bark's a good way to go they don't eat button bush either yeah button bush is always one of my favorites just i like it i think it's pretty plus the pollinators love it as well it, it's a it's probably the most pollinator covered uh bush when it is blooming i have seen just about everything utilizing it so uh yeah it's a good one it's a good one it's tough as nails i don't know if you could actually kill that plant it's it's pretty tough <laughs> yes exactly and it's also a good one for if you've got ponds and stuff like that as well because it can grow in flooded conditions quite easily yeah, it grows on all. We have the flood control reservoirs, you know, in our area for the TVA and also the Army Corps. And they drop those lakes 20, 30 feet every winter. And there's mud flats out there and uh, the button bush grows on it. You know, and it gets flooded every spring. It's underwater and uh, there it is. It's fine. So what are some of the other management activities that you like to do at this time of the year? It's a good time to cut down trees. Yes. Um, Again, for a lot of the same reasons, it's a good time to be in the woods. It's not hot. There's no bugs. Um, you don't have to worry about nesting critters, having babies in the tree this time of year. There's no bats in the trees this time of year. And there's no leaves on the trees this time of year. So um, cutting down a tree that has a full canopy of leaves on it, even if you have a little bit of wind, can really be horrible because they just act like a sail. It can take that tree where you don't want it. It can twist it off the stump. Um, cutting down trees, I would recommend you get trained in how to fell trees properly before you go out and cut down trees. I'm just going to throw that out there. It's dangerous. Okay. Um, you're cutting down something that weighs a few thousand pounds. Trees are heavy, but when there's no leaves on them, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, they don't hang up as bad when they hit each other and and they definitely don't catch the wind like they do when they have leaves. You don't have a bunch of sap this time of year either. Uh, the wood's fairly dry, makes it a lot easier to take that tree down. Right. And then again, like you said, we don't have to worry about nesting birds right now. And there's no maternity colonies of bats in them because all of our bats are hibernating. And most of the bat, well, all of the bats in most of the Southeast, once you get down to Florida, okay, all bits are off on hibernating. But for most of us, you don't have to worry about the bats in the trees, really, at this time of the year. In fact, if you've got anything that's doing federal funding, so cost shares and stuff like that, you can't cut down trees basically from April to November because of the potential for having bats in those trees. So this winter period is a really good time to cut down trees if you need to cut down some trees, even if you don't have federal funding, just because of, well, like you said, it's a whole lot easier to do it and you don't have to worry about the bats or birds or something like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I'm talking about cutting down trees, I'm cutting down generally pretty healthy looking trees. Uh, if it's a snag, I'm leaving it stand. You know, the, the woodpeckers are already using it and probably lots of wood eating insects already in there. If it's a tree that's alive, it's got a big hole in it, you know, it's obviously a den hole for something, I'm gonna leave it standing. But I'm, I'm namely cutting down trees to create early successional growth pockets, places that are gonna be brushy and have more forb growth, brambles, briars, shrubs, um, 
here in the Southeast, that's the type of habitat that, you know, a good 90% of your wildlife is going to utilize, not mature hardwoods that are full canopy and there is nothing growing on the ground because at ground level, it's basically a desert as far as wildlife are concerned. There's just nothing down there. There's no cover, there's no food. So a lot of the stuff that, that I usually cut is going to be smaller, 12 inch in diameter or less. It's places that were already open that somebody had left go for some reason. It's got a lot of pole timber growing in it. And it's almost always sweet gum, tulip poplar. Those are, those are the two. Uh, a few animals use tulip poplar. You know, it's good for pollinators. It's, it's good for squirrels and birds. They eat the seeds. Not a whole lot uses sweet gum. And it, it literally grows like grass. You open up a spot in some areas and you will get 2000 stems per acre or more of sweet gum. And, and it's not good. It's just not good. So go in there and cut that down. And they're generally small, so it's not super dangerous to do. So, yeah, but having that mixed, that diverse habitat is always good. And knowing a little bit about what the habitat was historically for your area is important too, because I mean, for us, we would have been in an area that, that had a lot of mixed habitat. So maybe some mostly closed canopy forest, a lot of open canopy forest um, trees scattered here and there and pockets through grasslands and more open areas. We would have had this very diverse mixed mosaic. But now when we drive through the area, it's either agriculture or urban suburban areas or woodlands right now. You don't see a lot of what would have been here historically. And so that's kind of where we're trying to take some of our property back to is that more historic looking. But so, yeah, you've got to be able to learn a little bit about what your habitat would have been and thereby, you know, what the animals that it might've supported because they kind of go hand in hand there. Yeah. And if you're, if you're going to go out and, and do that kind of habitat work, you really need to be able to identify what it is you're cutting down. Cause if I take down a sweet gum, I am going to stump treat that sweet gum because I don't want it coming back. You know, got enough of them. Don't need more. Uh, if I cut down an elm, I'm not going to stump spray the stump because elm produces great browse for deer and, and rabbits and other things. They love to eat that, that fresh sprouting elm. So, you know, that or black gum, I'm going to leave them. Tulip poplar, they'll eat that to some extent. Red maple, they'll eat that kind of stuff to some extent. But when you have, you know, 5,000 sweet gum, you have to, you have to spray that stump off or you're going to end up with 5,000 sweet gum because it will stump sprout right back and be 10 feet tall in a year because that's what sweet gum does. Um, you got to be able to identify your stuff. And, uh, you know, that goes for your shrubs too. There's a lot of good shrubs out there. And, and usually if I'm clearing out trees to do early successional growth, I'm going to leave the shrubs unless I have wall to wall cedar. And then I'm, I'm going to take a lot of that out because that's not good either. Right. But I mean, to even know what to take out, you've got to be able to identify what you've got. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You got to know what it is. You could probably learn the 20 most common trees in Kentucky fairly quickly. A lot of them are real, real distinctive. Uh, even without leaves, you could, you could learn them fairly quickly. Yeah. You're much better without leaves than I am, but I mean, I can at least get them all down to the, to the genus. I mean, I can look at it and say, that's an oak, that's a maple, that's a, and, and in some cases, that's as far as you really need to go. If you can get it to red oak, white oak, as far as habitat management goes, you're, you're doing pretty well. I mean, there's certain ones animals like to eat more than others, but you're doing well. If you know what your mix is on red oak, white oak, you're, you're doing well. Right. If you know what a sweet gum is, which would be a plan I would recommend everybody learns how to identify because they will take a place over very quickly. Um, super distinctive. If you got the leaf, there's no mistaking it for anything else. Without the leaf, there's really no mistaking it for anything else. But it all comes down to practice and just going out there and doing it. Right. I mean, even within the oaks and the maples and all that stuff, I can identify a lot of them down to species without the leaves. 
and then you can cheat and look on the ground and usually you can still find a leaf or an acorn and the acorns on the oaks can be very distinctive too as to what species and can help identify oh, yeah. so there's ways to do it it just takes a little bit more looking sometimes than might be if we have the leaves you have to hope that they produced acorns that year well yeah that's true too um but the acorns are helpful when you can find them i really like using the acorns yeah 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 and then if we're talking about planting herbaceous plants and seeds right now you probably don't want to be going out and planting plants if they're bare root maybe but otherwise probably not i mean the grounds the ground here in kentucky hasn't frozen yet but it will i mean it's not that much longer before it will freeze and i personally like to give my plants a little bit more time to let the roots get established before they freeze. But now's a really good time to be planting seeds if you've established a bed already. I mean, there's some of our native plants that need a winter before they'll germinate. So if you plant the seeds in the spring, say in April, when everybody wants to plant, they're not going to come up until next year. And if you're like me, you've probably forgotten that you planted it there and have given up on it coming up and have planned something else um, is usually what happens. But if you go out and sow your seeds now, it gives them the winter to have that winter treatment and to come up. Or you can start seeds inside, which is what I do a lot of times too. But still, you have to give them that winter treatment if you're not going to let them do it naturally. Yeah. And some of them need that freeze thaw the actions of the water and, you know, all, all the, the things that nature does to it to help break down that seed coat too. Um, a lot of the natives have really hard seed and they are a nightmare when you're growing them in a nursery setting because it's not like planting a bunch of beans or tomato seeds and they all come up within a day of each other and they're all nice and evenly aged. You have stuff that sprouts over a five month period. So you have all kinds of age discrepancy and nothing is the same. Um, some of them do take a long time. Bare root planting prime times coming up here in the next couple months. If you're planting bare root trees, that'd be the time to get them in the ground. Most of the nurseries won't ship them until late January, February, March. And then right about the time things start to warm up is the time to get those bare root trees in the ground. So um, most of the nurseries won't ship them until it's pretty much go time. So you're not having to hold on to them too long. They can be kind of a pain. You have to heal them in and keep the roots moist and make sure they don't get frost burned and all that. So it's, it's a lot easier when they just ship them to you and you can just plant them. Right. And I mean, with the herbaceous plants, the flowers, the wildflower type plants is what I grow a lot of as well for the nursery. And there are species that because of them needing that freeze thaw and the variety of different winter conditions, that's much harder to replicate. I, I've never gotten them to germinate with an artificial stratification, but I can plant them in a flat and put it outside and have wonderful germination that I can then pull out of the flat and transplant up into the larger pots. So really, if you're planting seeds, native wildflower seeds, Winter is a really great time to do it. And at least here in Kentucky, I mean, this is going to change a little bit if you go further north and stuff like that. Doing it in that Christmas, New Year's type time frame is really good because by now it's going to be getting colder. So you're not going to have to worry about as much at sprouting under a warm spell and then getting killed off the next week or what's about to happen to us, having a 70 degree day one day, and the next day being maybe 40, if we're lucky. And next week, it's supposed to be uh, three days of highs in the 20s. So, you know, it's just the way it is. Um, container plants, a lot of people buy container plants, and uh, everybody wants to plant them in the middle of summer and spring, because, you know, it's the time to plant things. And that works fine with a container plant as long as you keep it watered well. But you can literally, the best time to plant a container plant is October to mid-November, even into the beginning of December if it's not super cold out. 
You don't want the ground to freeze. It depends on where you're at. But here in Kentucky, you can get away with it a little later in the year. As long as that ground isn't frozen and you, if it looks like you're going to have a long way to go, I, I don't like to do it more than mid-November-ish. But you can get them in the ground. That plant might look totally dead on top and completely dormant. But that root system, as long as it has warm soil and that's relative it's warmer than the air and moisture the roots will continue to grow and they will grow slow but they will grow so by spring that plant's actually extended its root system maybe a quarter to a third a half if it's been really warm maybe it's doubled in size the plant's anchored and when it takes off in the spring it's going to grow it, you'll get a big burst of growth out of it so container plants theoretically when when we have this in you know in, in plant culture class they tell you theoretically you can plant them all year realistically no you're not going to go plant them when the ground's frozen but as long as you can work the soil and it it isn't super cold outside you can theoretically put them in the ground and they will do great see i prefer doing it here september october-ish by the end of october i really don't like planting anymore because kentucky's temperatures are so crazy and it could get cold. And I, I really like to have about a month with the soil warm enough that the roots can keep going, which if I get it in the end of October, that gives me all of November for root growth. And by the end of November, who knows what the weather's going to do here in Kentucky. Usually you're still good, but I like to be a little bit more conservative with my plantings. And some of it depends on the plant too, because the, the general thing is if it's a tree and it loses its leaves, you either want to stick it in the ground when it's got its leaves green or after it's dropped them. So yes. you don't want to put it in there in that transition stage because that plant's going through a lot at that moment. It's it's trying to put all of its energy down into its roots for the year. And you don't really want to mess with that. But after it's got its energy in the roots, you can stick it in the ground because the energy's there. So it's not translocating its nutrients anymore. But right. That's a good point, too, is that I tend to think in terms of the wildflowers and the herbaceous plants, you tend to think more in terms of the bushy, shrubby, woody stuff and the trees. So, yes, your planting window extends longer than my planting window for exactly that reason. Yeah, trees, as far as nursery propagation, planting, it's 12 months out of the year. It, it never really stops. So, I mean, I've got trees growing right now. So, mm -hmm. under lights with leaves on them, which was not the plan, but that's how it turned out. <laughs> yes. And then we've kind of moved into talking about planting stuff and nursery stuff, but this is also a really good time to go out. And if you're thinking about planting something next year to lay out the new beds, to put in hardscaping, if you're going to have paths and stuff like that, to do some of that work. Now, depending on how big of a new bed you're going to put in, you may not want to plant next year or next spring because if you're going to do like a whole field type situation, a larger area than like a typical small garden bed, you've probably got a year of prep work to get that thing ready or else you're going to have a weed control problem that you're not going to be able to handle. Smaller garden beds, you can get away with planting sooner because they're easier to weed. You're still going to have weed issues, but it's easier to handle. Um, you can handle more weeds in a 10 foot by 10 foot area if you're like me and decide to get a little over ambitious and plant sooner than you should, um, then you can if that's an acre or a quarter of an acre area. Yeah, and, and in an urban setting, if you have a yard, your weed issues are going to be fescue issues, more than likely. Fescue, bluegrass, uh, Bermuda, any of the cool season or Bermuda is a warm season, but they're perennial turf grasses or pasture grasses, if you're growing out in a big field, you're going to have your main problem is going to be fescue because chances are it used to be a cattle pasture. Honestly, early winter, great time to hit that with the first round of herbicide because it's still actively growing. I'm looking out the window. The fescue is bright green. It's over 55 degrees. I could go out there and spray fescue today and, and reliably get a pretty decent setback on it. Bad news is it's going to come back pretty fast. 
uh, just from the seed bank and from whatever didn't get killed. So it usually takes three, three treatments to really set back turf grass. It's hard to weed. It's best to get it killed. You know, if you have hen bit and stuff like that come up in your flower bed, easy to weed. Any of those little annuals, they come right out of the ground. I don't worry about those, but if you don't kill that turf grass, anything you plant's doomed. It'll just choke it out. And uh, winter is definitely the time to start getting on top of that. Yes. So that's something else that we can do during the winter. And then we mentioned invasive species earlier, like the woody stuff, privet and bush honeysuckle, and even English ivy um, being a woody vine. Is now a good time to be doing that work as well? Absolutely. Um, If it's got green leaves on it, it's still actively uh, photosynthesizing and uh, doing the things plants do. So you can definitely kill that. You can cut, stump, applicate herbicide onto things any time of the year. Uh, I would prefer it to be in the 50s just because it tends to make that stuff penetrate a little bit better. It tends to increase the uh, efficiency of it. But Uh, I do know guys that go out and basil bark uh, Alanthus up north when it is cold out. You know, there's snow on the ground and they're basil barking it. It will kill it. It's a good time to do this kind of stuff. It's not hot. You're not having to worry about, you know, getting eaten alive by bugs or passing out from heat exhaustion while you're out there. It's much easier on your body when you're trying to do this stuff when it's cool out. And it's a lot easier to identify a lot of it, especially privet, bush honeysuckle, most of the vines, uh, you can just pick them right out. So yeah, it's a great time to do that. Always read the label on this on your herbicide and on your basil oil. It will tell you the minimum temperature requirement, uh, or it'll say something like uh, lower efficiency if applied below such and such temperature, which just means you might have to go back and hit it again. Honestly, something like Alanthus on a basil bark, it has such thin bark, it tends to absorb a lot of herbicide pretty easily and you can kill a fairly large tree of heaven with basil bark i know it says six inch tree everything you read about basil bark and that that's that's kind of an average if it's super thin barked in Atlantis is it it will kill a quite large tree don't chop them down yes don't chop them down don't mow them down you're just going to create a bigger issue with tree yeah. of heaven or Atlantis. yeah tree of heaven if you cut it down and then you spray it, you may kill it, but chances are you're going to cut it down and you, you might kill that main stem, but the root system will have already said, huh, we've been chopped down. It's time to sprout. And you're going to have, you know, 200 sprouts come off on that root system. So it's like you kill one, 200 come to the funeral and now you got a problem. And, and I've been to a lot of farms where people have done this. And it's just a mess. And you have to go basil bark every one of those stems. And, uh, you know, it's not hard to kill. It's just, it's just a pain once it gets to that point. Once you basil bark it and it's dead, you know, I mean, spring comes, it leaves out, they all turn brown, they fall off, the tree's dead. Then you can cut it down. And I advise you do, because if you don't, it's going to come down, you know, a couple months later in a windstorm. And it's not going to fall where you want it to. So go ahead and chop it down at that point. But yeah, don't cut them down to get rid of them because it, it does, does not work. It's it's bad. Yes, exactly. And I mean, I know invasive species and invasive species management is something that a lot of people are really interested in because it's something that we're all dealing with. If you've got any property at all, you're dealing with it, even in urban and suburban areas. I mean, sometimes that's the worst areas because there's so much there, but yeah. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll have to have you back on again some other time to talk all about invasive species and different ways to manage them. Yeah. That, Cause that's a pretty in-depth thing. I mean, you could have one podcast on getting rid of just Alanthus or Eliagnus or, you know, you know, it, 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 it gets involved. Um, yes. And the other thing is, I know some people get overwhelmed. They look at their farm or their property and, you know, there's 10 acres of autumn olive. I mean, there's places like that in eastern Kentucky. It's 10 acres of autumn olive. Don't worry about killing it all at one time. Um, chances are the critters that live around there, that's the only cover they have. So, you know, take out part of it, replace it with something else and move on, take out another piece of it, but don't make sure there's some habitat available for whatever was utilizing that Heliagnus to move into 
because um, if you just go wipe it all out you just left whatever was using it without a place to go so and that that's not good either i mean the invasive species are bad they're terrible um they have lots of environmental ramifications beyond what most people think they they affect things on levels that most people don't realize um, as far as reproduction survival um food utilization uh it goes way deep Mm -hmm. But uh, if that's all they've got and you take it all away, well, then they're kind of dead <laughs> um, completely. So, you know, and, and it gets overwhelming if you're trying to take out 10 acres or something, you know, just work on an acre of it, get it replaced. Once you get it replaced, move on to the next acre of it. And if you can kill it off, the one thing I would recommend is trying to get something else growing in there that's native. Definitely. Whether you go in there and plant it, plug it, seed it, whatever, because you've opened up the soil, you're probably going to get another flush of invasive species. And it may not be the same one. It could be something completely different. Yeah. It's not just about removing it and getting rid of it. You have to replace it. That's, that's a very important part of the whole process. Yeah. Open, open soil is is not good in an area with lots of invasive species. Okay. You're, you're just going to end up with more. Um, more than likely, the reason they're invasive is they outcompete everything that we have that's native. So, you know, uh, they have an advantage because nothing really kills them. Right. But yeah, I've been thinking about that for a while. And in fact, I've got several people planned that are going to be talking about different types of invasive species and some of the stuff that we're learning. But um, yeah, might have to might have to do an invasive species management or an invasive plant species management episode. Yeah, we won't go into wild hogs and uh, no, because there like are that. more than invasive plants. I mean, a lot of times we tend to talk about invasive species as being plants, but no, there's a lot of other things out there: mammals, insects, lots of insects, lots and lots of insects. Yes, lots of funguses. Yes, um, a few mammals. Um, wild hogs, the big one, but a few mammals, few reptiles, few amphibians. Mm -hmm. And again, it all depends on where you're at too. Because the same invasive species aren't necessarily all across the east or all across the continent. I mean, it really depends on where you're at as to what you're dealing with or the major ones you're dealing with. Yeah, and a lot of the amphibians are things that are native in the east, but they're invasive in the desert southwest, like tiger salamanders and bullfrogs. You know, we just think of them as, yeah, that's just normal. Well, they didn't have those out there and they are causing all kinds of problems. So... But um, yeah, getting back to what we were actually going to be talking about today, because we've kind of wandered a little bit, but that's okay. Is there anything else that you want to add as far as things that people should be looking for, thinking about for habitat management for pollinators and wildlife during the winter? It's a good time to go out and just figure out where you want to do some habitat work. You know, maybe you've got a big hole in a field that's nothing but fescue. You know, they've got good habitat everywhere else. And there's just this big green blob out there. It's a good time to see that because when everything's green, it doesn't always show up because there might be other things growing in it during the spring and summer. And you don't realize you have, you know, that non-native perennial grass growing in there to such an extent. Um, deer are losing their antlers now. It's always fun to go out and look for sheds, kind of like Easter eggs, only made out of bone. So a little <laughs> different. Deer are losing their antlers already. I've had several people contact me saying they're finding antlers. So mm -hmm. it seems a little early to me, usually mid-January is when I get out there to look for antlers, but um, they're dropping already. So not all of them will. Some will, won't drop till February. But good time to go out and track, look for animal dens. You can find dens this time of year really well because the, the dirt aprons show up great when all the vegetation's down. Good time to go out and look for hawk and eagle nest. Yeah. They show up really well this time of year. Right. And, and the eagles will already be on the nest. So. I was about to say, yeah, the eagles are going to be either on the nest or now or will be on the nest because they breed, they breed early. So do a lot yeah, of our hawks and owls. They breed relatively early. Yeah. The, the eagles are on it now. Great horned owls should be nesting soon. Yeah, when it gets to wildlife watching and viewing, oh my gosh, the winter can be amazing time. We've got different birds out there than some of our spring and summer birds. 
I mean, you don't have the stupid leaves on there causing problems to get in the way and hide them all the time. I mean, that's one nice thing about not having leaves on the trees as well as that makes the birds stand out better. Yeah. And like you said, the eagle's nests, hawk nests are so much easier to see now. Yeah, um, you can see some interesting behavior this time of year. Uh, a lot of times you can find foxes or coyotes uh, pouncing on mice out in a field. Easier to see them because there's not a lot of green. Uh, you can watch the doe deer box each other, lower food resources this time of year. Uh, the dominant does don't like other ones coming anywhere near them. And uh, they'll get up on their hind legs and kick at each other. And it's pretty entertaining. It's amazing how violent they are. I think they're way meaner than the bucks. The bucks are pretty chill for, you know, 11 months out of the year. The does are like this 12 months out of the year. You just don't see it as easily. But uh, yeah, some interesting stuff going on out there for sure. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if it's a really warm day, I have seen snakes in February in Kentucky. So um, you never know. Turtles, definitely. January, February, if it's warm, you'll see turtles. And it's real easy to see them this time of year. Yeah, exactly. I mean, winter is, there's so much that you can find and do. I mean, winter is definitely not a time to go hide inside and curl up. I mean, it's fun to curl up and read a book under a blanket all day, but there's also a lot of fun things you can do outside too. Definitely want to get out there and see and explore and do stuff during the winter as well. Yeah, it's a good time to have a good pair of binoculars. Um, you can see a lot farther without the leaves on the trees. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you got some good binoculars, you can really really do some good wildlife viewing this time of year. Yeah. Well, is there anything else you want to add? No, I think I'm going to try to go outside and get a couple of things looked at and done before this next big batch of rain hits, which looks like it's blowing in. Okay. Um, well, thanks a lot and have a great day. You too. Thank you. I appreciate Anthony taking time to talk with us today. Habitat management activities that we can do in the winter is one of those topics that I get asked about frequently. So, I thought it might be helpful to just share with you some of the things that we do on our farm at this time of the year, or that we recommend to others. And of course, our conversation wandered into nature observation topics several times, because being able to see and enjoy the nature on our property is one of the reasons why we do the habitat work that we do. I hope our conversation was helpful as you think about activities to do on your own property this winter. Before I wrap this up, I want to ask a favor of you. If you find value in the Backyard Ecology content, please consider joining our community of supporters. There are many ways you can support Backyard Ecology, both financially and non-financially. Learn more at www.backyardecology.net slash join dash us. Until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yard and community.